Namaste everyone. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to begin this podcast series on women and Hinduism uh, with Madhu Kishwarji. Uh, she needs no introduction uh, really, uh, but uh, before I introduce her, um, I want to take a moment uh, to tell you all about this uh, podcast series. Um, at Indica, we believe that uh, women's position in Hinduism is under-researched. Uh, we believe strongly that Hinduism has been misunderstood um, and along with it, Hinduism's understanding of women uh, as well. Uh, this has happened mostly because of a skewed social science that accepts uh, certain Western and modern discourses uncritically and seeks to erase anything uh, that it sees as tradition. What is worse is that those who seek to erase tradition um, often are those who have never embarked on any kind of serious research into tradition. Mainstream feminists in India place undue importance upon effects alone, not causes. And they have a very narrow uh, notion of progress, development, and equality. Um, their critique of the family is not culture sensitive at all. And they have an improper understanding of masculinity and femininity across castes. They have a lack of clarity about Victorian moral values and what existed prior to it. And they are not in touch with women's experiences and they seek social transformation before clearly understanding what is on the ground. There is a quick dismissal of Hinduism under a generalized statement that all religions are patriarchal and they can include only gender feminism, not sexual difference feminism, and they have no interest in femininity, nor little interest in femininity. And they merge activism with academic work in ways that do justice to neither. Um, so they accept uh, modernity uncritically and the human rights discourse uh, uncritically as well. Um, I think that the culture question has been largely ignored by uh, mainstream feminists in India and post-colonial feminists should not be doing this. And this is where I think Indica comes in uh, because we love to inquire about what our cultural heritage endows us with and we are ready to be critical. We want to weigh in on strengths as well as weaknesses. Um, at this point, I just want to thank our um, founder, Hari Vadlamaniji, um, uh, who makes these events possible, who nurtures scholars like me. And I'm very grateful to him for giving me a free hand in conducting this po podcast. Um, as intellectuals uh, need just that, genuine academic freedom. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about um, Madhu Vishwarji. Um, Madhuchi is the well-known um, founder of uh, the journal Manushi. Um, she has worked on various issues uh, concerning women, such as uh, dowry, domestic violence, women's reservation, and so on, uh, but also on issues uh, such as Bhakti, Manusmriti, uh, the Khap Panchayats, on Gandhi, on the rejection of Rama in villages across India, and so on. Um, she, she addresses class issues, uh, urban-rural divide issues, and is sensitive to the pulse of Indian culture. Uh, her essay, Why I'm Not a Feminist, is controversial for the right reasons, <laughs> and is well known too. Um, she's a lone voice, uh, but very strong, and has stood alone. Um, and she has faced opposition even when she was speaking reasonably. Um, so uh, I have much to learn from her. And I've recently called her the queen of balanced views. Um, her jargon-free writing uh, is something that I totally adore. Um, so, uh, but I have to say that I haven't read her latest works uh, on uh, Modiji and uh, the uh, Kathua book, The Girl in Kathua, right? Um, that one, um, and I've promised to read, uh, but I'm familiar with some of the other work um, in uh, edited uh, volumes such as Off the Beaten Track and In Search of Answers. And uh, today we are going to talk about um, 
dowry and um I have some general questions uh, for Madhuji. Her work was very different from the kind of work that some of the other feminists um, in India at that time were doing. And uh, that's why we want to talk to her today and we want to learn from her. Um, my first question, uh, Madhuji, if I could start off, uh, is, um, is about a certain Manushi report uh, wherein you tell us that you visited a locality where uh, a number of dowry deaths had happened and you describe it as a horror of horrors. And um, and and uh, that that piece kind of was very uh, terrifying to read. Um, and uh, I want to know from you, uh, when did we become like this? How, how did we become like this? Because uh, uh, before this, um, uh, before this, in the sense that in unless in modernity, we don't have any records of, uh, you know, such deaths. Uh, occurring uh, in Hindu households. So, uh, thank you, Sushubna, and thank you, Indika, for inviting me to start this series. I think this is your first program, yeah. and I'm really honored to be starting this series. Uh, it's much needed. Uh, somehow, the non leftist ecosystem has almost altogether ignored women's issues, family issues. We only hear about political issues, the larger picture, communal issues, Hindu, Muslim, religious conversions, this, that, and the other. But the founding rock of any society is its family. And certainly Hindu society uh, has demonstrated to the world uh, what close-knit families, extended families, large extended families look like and how they stay together. Uh, all that is changing very fast. And uh, under the influence of Macaulayite education and feminism and all that, people have even in India begun to treat family as a liability rather than the biggest asset we possess. Now, how did we come to a point where things like wife murder starts taking place? I, in the early writings, you know, you only read my very early writings. These are 1980s, what, the two books you referred to. Mm -hmm. uh, and subsequently, my writing on these issues, my understanding of these issues has constantly evolved, changed as... I got better informed as I got more close to ground reality as well as study of history. Now, the one thing that we tend to ignore, even those who are constantly obsessed with Hindu Muslim issues, is the large scale, very lethal form of Islamization of the Hindu mind. For example, you talk about, we come to wife murders later. And I'll explain why I call them wife murders and not dowry murders. Um, even way before we come to that, if you look at the average Hindu male today, dirty, filthy ma behen ki galis uh, flow out of his mouth like an incessant... Uh, Jharna, you know, non-stop. Um, it's like sewage flowing out of the mouth. Now, Ma Behen Ki Gali, telling someone that he is capable of having sex with or fucking his mother or sister or daughter or whatever, is absolutely unimaginable for a Hindu mind. We worship our mothers. Our sisters are treated with special reverence and brothers are supposed to take responsibility for their safety and security and to think that they could be raping them or having sex with them is absolutely outrageous. This has not been part of our uh, history. Similarly, rape has not been part of our history. I mean, what happened in Mahabharat? Just Chir Haran, no rape. And yet there was a Mahabharat war. 
Ravan abducts Sita, but he doesn't dare touch her against her will. And yet the big uh, war between Ram and Ravan takes place. Uh, because we were very sensitive to the honor of women, simply because the conception of the feminine in the Hindu tradition is that she is the divine force that moves the universe. She is the energy that moves the universe. And even male devatas, devatas are dead without their shakti. She is shakti, the primordial uh, shakti that is the power behind the entire universe. And the birth of a daughter would be celebrated as the coming of Lakshmi, the birth, the coming in of a daughter-in-law. Even today, the rituals are that Lakshmi aaye ghar mein. And so she, as she walks in, she um, she dips her feet in a turmeric, uh, in turmeric water, in a pan or a pot carrying turmeric water. And as she walks, those footprints are actually saved by people uh, on paper and many many families I know actually save those footprints on a in, in a safe locker and this is passed down from generation to generation now in such a culture we not only hear ma ben ki gali as punctuation marks almost as punctuation marks but also wife battering, wife beating to the point of killing them um, became fairly common. Uh, so I really think that this is in large part due to Islamization mm -hmm. of our culture uh, because women were chattel in Islamic culture. And secondly, we cannot escape the fact that when men of any community or country fail to protect their families, fail to protect the women of their families. And especially for Hindu men, it must have been very traumatic that Islamic invaders came and turned lakhs and lakhs of women into sex slaves after they defeated local rulers. And imagine for Rajputs or the proud Jats or the many martial communities of India, how traumatic this must have been, how humiliating those defeats must have been. As a result, in all those areas where Islam came to hold sway, mm -hmm. where Muslim rulers came to acquire unchallenged un, uh, control, um, you see Parda, Chardevari, women being confined, within the four walls of the house, being prevented from participating in public affairs, and many other pathologies, such as a female infanticide. What do you do with daughters? If you know that their fate is going to be very tragic, they could be abducted any minute and turned into sex slaves. What do you do with daughters if you can't protect them? And there is, can you hear this noise? Uh, not really. We're good. Oh, then it's okay because loud drumming for some celebration is going on. I'm sure you can edit this out, right? I think they'll, yes, they will edit uh, this. Uh, so female infanticide became so rampant that in North India, especially in Rajasthan and even parts of Punjab, which were constantly being trampled over by these Islamic courts, people began to boast of villages where no daughter had been born for generations. They wouldn't let them survive. And I'm not surprised if I had to live under those circumstances. I'm sure I would not want a daughter. I'm sure I would rather that she be dead before or soon after she's born than face the kind of humiliations women had to face under Islamic rule. It's even to read about it for me is traumatic that mm -hmm. lakhs and lakhs of women, including of royal households, would be paraded naked, sold in the bazaars of Delhi, Agra, Lahore, and the Middle East, the Islamic countries, um, as chattel, and sold while they were being paraded naked. Think of what trauma our society went through. 
And the depth of that trauma can be gauged from the fact that there is no record by any Hindu historian, literary writer, nobody wrote about it. The facts of the brutality committed by Islamic invaders mm -hmm. is all recorded in their own writings and with great pride. We didn't have the heart or even the vocabulary to write about it. Only Guru Nanak writes. In, you know, there are few verses in Guru Granth Sahib, but other than that, you don't see any Hindu records. Tulsi Das was witnessing all this. Do you see or uh, read even two lines describing what was happening to Hindu women or to Hindu families or to Hindu Samaj? No. Um, they found other ways of protecting their temples. You know, if real temples are being broken, then my heart is my temple. Ram, Sita, yahan baste hain. Hanuman taught us that. So don't depend on physical temples um, because they were being devastated. So you see that trend even in the Bhakti movement. Total silence because the negativity that comes with Islam is something beyond the ken, beyond the wildest imagination of the Hindu Samaj. And I don't think our Samaj even had a vocabulary to express their rage. Huh? Because Sarva Dharma Sambhav and this world is a family. We, we, we didn't know how to treat people not just as others, but barbaric others mm -hmm. who don't follow any human norms. So living under those kind of regimes certainly had an impact. And mm -hmm. therefore, wife beating, confining women, putting uh, severe restrictions on their life, on their movement, became fairly common in areas that witnessed Islamic invasions. And let me tell you mm -hmm. how even up to 20th century, my own family history, my mother grew up in Peshawar. And as you well know, even before 1947, Peshawar, unlike places like Lahore, had a very small Hindu population, they were very Islam dominated and very uh, militant Islamic communities there. And my mother tells me that when they used to go to school, the Tonga that carried Hindu girls to the school, not only had a thick chadar around mm -hmm. it so that nobody could see who was sitting inside, mm -hmm. lest uh, somebody takes a fancy and drags out these girls and just abducts them. But then they all had to wear those big chadors when they went to school. Of course, I, when they reached their school or college, um, they were normal. They shared all that. I see pictures of my mother in her school without even the patta, just wearing a coat in winter. Uh, and the moment they came to Delhi, even though as refugees, they had to stay again in old Delhi, which was till then Muslim dominated. But... There was no chadar, there was no sar dhakna, there were no restrictions. My mossies were driving bicycles, riding bicycles. They were going for evening shows uh, all by themselves. Their life changed overnight. So the same family which had to send its daughters under that kind of a cover. And there was no question of a daughter of any Hindu family walking into a bazaar in Peshawar all by herself or even with female friends. No question that they stepped out like that. The moment they come to Delhi, within no time, almost overnight, my Masis were going to Connaught Place for shopping. As I said, they were eating out in restaurants. They were shopping all by themselves without any male escort. Now, that tells you uh, what it means to live under Islam. And therefore, many of their cultural traits, including rape, including treating women as property, including uh, beating them to uh, control them, so to speak, uh, it was unimaginable, you know, a man hitting a wife or a daughter mm -hmm. in our culture. This You don't see any reference to rape or wife battery at mm -hmm. all in pre-Islamic India. And even up to 19th, 17th, 16th century, you wouldn't hear about these things. I mean, it's not part of any 
uh, of our literature. It's only with Prem Chand and all that they start describing the pathetic position of women. So that's one. Now, when we come to the issue of dowry, firstly, let's be clear. Dowry is not a Hindu word. It's not part of our vocabulary. It comes from Europe. Then the hage, the other word. The hage is also of Arabic origin. It doesn't come from the Hindu tradition. What we had instead is a stridhan, which is a woman's own inalienable property, which she inherited either from a parental family or she got by way of gifts from her marital family. Or it was self-acquired because a lot of women were also in business. They were entrepreneurs. They were part of the economy in pre-Islamic India. So all of this, Sridhan gives way to dowry and, uh, and uh, dowry, the hedge and all the rest. A, when uh, women are confined, they can't be part of the economic activities. When families are afraid to even send their wives and daughters to the, their own fields um, in the village itself, uh, especially where they are living amidst Islamic communities and where certainly women are not taking part in trading, etc., cetera, um, in bazaars or in any enterprise. So they begin to appear dependent, but the worst kind of onslaughts against women's rights mm -hmm. uh, through the legal route take place during the British rule. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you look at all our um, Hindu personal law, various schools of Hindu personal law, two main ones, as you know, are Dyabhag and Mitakshar, with many subsets within it, but both these. And then, of course, uh, we had Maramakutyam in the south and uh, matrilineal family systems in the northeast also. Large parts of south as well as large parts of northeast that were all Hindu uh, dominated areas had uh, matrilineal family systems. Now, even those that were not matrilineal, which means the property passed from mother to daughter, not from father to son, even in the patrilineal systems like Mitakshar and Deabhad, some things are very noteworthy. Unlike the notions of property in Europe, for example, from where we borrowed many of our modern day notions of property and how to pass it on, uh, property in India was a family asset. It was never individually owned. And whether Deabhag or Mitakshar, whoever is the head of the family was called Karta. Karta means you are def you, you, you are responsible for the well-being of the whole family. You're managing it for everybody. You don't own it. Mm -hmm. And we had no concept of willing away property, which is to say no father could disinherit a daughter or a daughter-in-law, um, the rights of even unborn children were protected, which is to say that if a son died young and his wife was pregnant, it's not as if in the family property, the rights of that unborn child could be ignored. Uh, he or she had had the same rights as though the, they were full, full grown adults. Now, in such a situation, uh, women could count on inalienable rights in the family property. And of course, in matrilineal systems, um, it passed on from mother to daughter. So there was no question of disinheriting. But the British, since they were used to a very nasty form of patriarchal family structure, where men owned everything, women were, uh, even in biblical lore, you can see, how low the status of the feminine is in, in, in the Bible. She's merely a temptress. She caused the fall of mankind. She has too many infirmities. She obviously can't be trusted with decision-making and certainly not 
property, family property management. So they never had property rights till the last century when they fought and fought for basic rights to be first recognized as full human beings, then citizenship rights, right to vote. They had to fight for that. We never had to do that. So the point is that when the British imposed the same system in India and through land settlement operations, all over India, wherever the British carried out land settlement operations, they made the male head of the family the owner of that family. Why did they need to do that? Because revenue collection becomes easy if there's one person from whom you have to collect tax and that person alone is responsible. And if the person fails to do that on account of famine or any other uh, adversity, you can take over the property, you can take over the land. Again, this was absolutely unknown. We had this concept, Sab Bhumi Gopalki. Even the king didn't own. No king ever claimed to own land. Mm -hmm. It was assumed to be the gift of Mother Nature mm -hmm. or this one short sentence says it all, Sab Bhumi Gopalki. You don't own Mother Earth. You're there to use it. And that is why people had usufructory rights, not selling, buying, all this came with the British. And of course, under the guise of reforming Hindu law, the Hindu Succession Act made property alienable, willable. The head of the family can will it away to whoever he likes. And hence the marginalization of women from not just economic activity, but also ownership of property led to the culture of compensating the daughter through dowries. Now, dowry being different from stridhan, I think has to be understood very, very uh, carefully. A, stridhan is property that you own, a woman owns. Sridhar is inalienable. Nobody can take it away. Even her husband couldn't take it. And if the husband under any circumstances mm -hmm. in times of difficulty had to borrow some money from her Sridhar, he paid back with interest. And you didn't go to courts of law. The community ensured it. These were well-established community norms. And the Viradri, the larger kinship group, ensured that people followed this norm. Now, from there, once the property gets to be owned by men and women get confined, then naturally there's going to be erosion of their rights. And the British made sure they left nothing in the name of women. And sadly enough, of in independent India, so-called, after the transfer of power in 1947, even the so-called land reforms that the mm -hmm. Congress government, Nehruvian government carried out, they didn't keep any share for the daughter. So if 18 acres was the ceiling, mm -hmm. the land ceiling, mm -hmm. then that was only for sons. You only could, uh, each son could be given 18 acres, mm -hmm. uh, but there was no share for daughters. In such a situation then, A, daughters appear like a burden. Yeah. They've been withdrawn sort of from an active economic role because of this Islamic influence. And then come these inheritance laws with large scale immiseration of Hindu community. Mm -hmm. uh, they sucked our blood. They, the farmers um, had their blood sucked, led to landlessness of very high order because they will they would take away land if revenue couldn't be paid due to famine or drought or floods or whatever. So large scale landlessness comes into being. Mm -hmm. Very high revenue extortion to the point in some places even up to 90% left nothing in the hands of farmers. So you had very small holdings except where the British gave zamidaris in order to facilitate land revenue collection. 
they didn't give these land as total ownership for the so-called zamidar, but as their agents to extort revenue to the maximum extent possible. In such a situation, people couldn't give solid assets. So at the time of marriage, whatever little families could give mm -hmm. began to be given in the form of, it was still called Sridhan, uh, but the age becomes uh, 20th century, late 19th century vocabulary. Um, if you see even 19th, early 19th century, 18th century, A, there's no mention of the age. Certainly no mention of torture due to the age. Uh, no mention of conflicts over the age because what you gave to your daughter was also part of very well-established, carefully carved out norms of what is her due in the family property. You don't... This is a very powerful uh, sentence that parents will use when you say, When we send her even to a hostel of study abroad, don't we fill a suitcase with so many new clothes, with so many new things and assets so that uh, she doesn't need anything? So now that she's leaving, our family forever, how can we send a Kaliya? Now, this business of giving her some share, some share, however minimal, mm -hmm. in an impoverished setup as part of a due when she's leaving the house, how does it come to be uh, transformed into dowry? Uh, you know, the Hages, as I said, very Islamic. And they do practice the hedge. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, in later decades of 20th century, it becomes bride price, uh, groom price. Even the hedge gets transformed into groom price, which mm -hmm. is to say that as men took to new jobs, especially those in Sarkari jobs, who got uh, well-paying, relatively well-paying jobs as compared to their rural-based families or their artisanal families, um, then they became prized assets. With short supply of such grooms, they were really then prized possessions. And to make a match with such a groom, you had to pay extra. Because the parents felt, well, they had spent so much on this son look we have invested our all and so we need compensation mm -hmm. now that groom price is what we are dealing with it's not dowry and the conflicts over dowry that came to be and led also to murders and mm -hmm. why i don't call them dowry murders but wife murders is that domestic violence takes place and even murders of wives take place even in societies where there's no dowry mm -hmm. Europe America I mean isn't wife murder girlfriend murder fairly common battering a wife battering even a girlfriend aren't they very common so if it was only dowry that produced violence mm -hmm. then Europe America there should be no incentive to beat up uh, a wife because at least as per the myth uh, created by the anti-dowry campaigners, they beat her up so as to extort more money. Well, at least it makes some economic sense. Huh? You beat up someone, you get money and you get rewarded. Why wouldn't you beat her up? But how foolish must the British or the French and the American men must be? They're not even going to get anything. And yet they beat up wives and even girlfriends. So I began to understand over time. Initially, even I thought these were dowry murders. Uh, but soon it became clear that that's really not the case. Domestic violence takes place even in India or globally in families where there is no, uh, uh, there's no tradition of giving in that fashion. Uh, but the way this was done, you see this whole business of dowry and only Hindu community, mind you, was attacked. Mm -hmm. The Muslim community was never attacked, though it has the age. Yes. Okay. 
And you know, when you tell the Muslims, but you too have the hijab, they say, oh, we copied this bad thing from Hindus. It's because of dirty Hindu influence. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what they actually openly say. Yeah. It's their word. They mm -hmm. do it, but they put it on to us. Now, initially, when we started Manushi, the first issue, as you know, was launched in January 1979. Mm -hmm. And at that time, um, as you would have read, uh, read in my earlier writing, uh, newspapers, especially page three, used to be full of small six line, seven line news items talking about kitchen accidents, a woman dying due to stove burst, or her sari caught fire while she was cooking on a gas chula, so on and so forth. And this was quite routine, but as it happened, when in our own neighborhood, some such uh, deaths took place and we investigated, we found that uh, it, these were cases of murder. They were not kitten accidents. And it was a logical question to ask, how is it that only daughters-in-law die in kitchen accidents? Never daughters, never a mother-in-law, not a sister-in-law. Why only? Why do stoves burst only on daughter-in-law? So when we investigated, we found that these were actually murders. And Manushi actually played a lead role in mm -hmm. building consensus, building uh, an atmosphere of protest by actually uh, launching some of the early protests against dowry murders. And since the police was almost always complicit in protecting mm -hmm. the murdering family, mm -hmm. Uh, as you well know, you bribe them and they will happily convert any murder into suicide or accident. So most of our protest demonstrations were outside the police station. Some of them even in courts, mm -hmm. because the courts also became complicit. I remember this very controversial, you can say today, but at that time it's so well received. Uh, when the Sazari court in Delhi, mm -hmm. two judges had given... Uh, two different judgments uh, exonerating the murdering family, not taking into account even the last dying testimony of the wives concerned. Now, as per law, it's mm -hmm. supposed to be the final proof. If the dying testimony says so-and-so murdered me, you're supposed to book that person. But they found reasons, obviously, because they were Right. So we even protested against the courts in many of such cases. And of course, a, a, a novel form of protest, which wouldn't be possible in America, Europe, is that we would go protest outside the house of the family where the woman had been murdered. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to mobilize the neighborhood to say, Let's socially boycott these families, whether the police punishes them or not, whether the courts uh, indict them or not. It's important that society boycott such families. And that, I think, became a very important message. And these protests, some of the early protests that Manushi was part of, we also wrote about them. They were widely covered in newspapers. They became kind of a prototype for protests all over the country. But uh, you want to know why I changed my views on this? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Is there you want to ask and when, or yeah. you want me to continue? Yeah, you can continue. Uh, I was going to ask what changed. Yes, absolutely. See, you would have, uh, if you read the early books of my, uh, mine, then in the seventh issue of Manushi, which is, I think, in 1980, I had issued a call for dowry boycott. Uh, at that time, it, it, it appeared that a lot of these women were being killed on account of dowry conflicts. Bring more money, bring a car, bring a scooter, bring this, bring that. Yeah. That seemed to be the narrative. So I felt that if dowry is the problem, then we should boycott. Those of us who go protest outside other people's homes, those of us who lead protest outside police stations, uh, the least we owe to our own conscience 
is to boycott dowry weddings in our own family and community. Um, because I sincerely believe, and I till date I'm naive enough to believe that we should practice what we preach. I realize that that's not how the feminist mind works. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> they preach to the whole world, but none of their prescriptions are valid for themselves or their own families. Mm -hmm. So I used to see some of my feminist friends, some of them very good, close buddies of mine. In the morning, we are protesting against uh, a dowry murder, so-called. Um, and in the evening, very merrily, they dress up in their fancy silk saris and go and attend dowry weddings, dowry weddings in their own family or in their own social circle. So this used to really bug me a lot. And when I saw some of my closest uh, feminist colleagues doing it, mm -hmm. I uh, issued this through Manushi by court call for all dowry weddings. Mm -hmm. Now, no more than 10, 15 persons took the vow that I took, which is to say, we shall not attend any dowry wedding, be it in our own family, be it that of a closest relative. And I, like a naive fool, for 13 long years, attended no marriage, uh, including that of my first cousins. And I can't tell you how much I hurt some of my close relatives. Mm -hmm. At least one of my close cousins uh, who's very, very attached to me, has never forgiven me till date that I refused to attend her wedding. Even though this is my Masi's daughter, even though the so-called dowry was so modest that you'd be embarrassed about it. I mean, nothing big. Mm -hmm. The groom's family asked for nothing. And uh, the my Masi's family gave whatever they could afford easily without any hassle. And yet I didn't attend that shadi. And I haven't been forgiven that till date. She's so hurt from it that though we are very close again, I mean, we, but I think that has never, that, that pain has never left her because she counted on me as a closest. And um, she thought I would be the one who would be mastering all the ceremonies and, you know, decking her up as a bride. And I didn't even attend the wedding. Now, in these 13 years, the only two weddings that were totally dowry free were that of my own brothers. Uh, out of respect for me, my parents and my brothers ensured nothing, nothing came. Well, that strict about it. And even the token gift that they give to the uh, sister of the groom, I returned. Not even that token gift was taken. But I can tell you that all our relatives and our family friends said, you're being foolish in doing this. Because when all the rishtas for my brothers were coming, they were all warning us this dowryless, dowryless uh, slogan that you are uh, uh, chanting, your son will be viewed as a defective product. Mm -hmm. So there was lot of tehkikat being done. What's wrong with these two boys? Are they, do they have some medical defect? Do they have some other infirmity, etc., etc.? And I can tell you that the few dowry-less weddings that I got to know of even later certainly are not the happiest of examples because the in-laws treat you as Mufat Kamal. Mm -hmm. You know, when you've invested heavily in getting a son-in-law, you take the family very seriously. You've invested that your daughter is placed well there. She's well treated. But when Mufat me aata hai son-in-law, then mm -hmm. you think something is wrong with his family. And so it's not as if such families get better respect. That, that was shattering for me to see all around me. Anyway, the long and short of it is that in these 13 years, Lot of women argued with me vehemently, saying, what kind of nonsensical stand have you taken? A, we have a right over some part of our parental property. We're not going to inherit the assets. The house is going to go to the brothers, whatever land or factory or business shares they have, they're not going to come to us. This is the only time we are going to give in 
a share of the parental wealth? Why should we be deprived of it? Will you ensure that we are given equal property rights? If you can't ensure, you shut up. Secondly, they said, see, when you go to a new family, you can't go there in just three clothes you're wearing. As I said, even when you go to the hostel, your parents equip you with everything from shoes to undergarments to every little thing that you will need for those one or two years. So they said, now we're going to go there permanently. And you expect us that we want to buy a new pair of shoes. We should be asking somebody for money. If we have to buy a petticoat, we should be asking somebody for uh, some money or have pocket money. And once we go there with our own things, including some furniture, new furniture, you feel, yes, this house, I've put something in it. I've invested in it. My parents have invested in, in my placement here. And therefore, some kind of familiarity grows with, with even the objects around. And uh, you want to deprive us of that uh, little pleasure of getting new things, jewelry, etc. And finally, the other clinching argument that women gave was, again, this, that in dowry-less societies, women are getting maltreated, no less ferociously. So what's the guarantee? What's the guarantee that a dowry-less wedding will get, get it all uh, hunky-dory? And one more thing I understood later on, uh, over a longer period of time. See, this new daughter-in-law who goes to this family, now you will say, but if she's not a dependent, she's well-educated, she also has a job, so why should her parents pay a dowry? Because they're not sending a dependent to the in-law's family. But, mm -hmm. but she's going to claim property rights in that family. Even after divorce, mm -hmm. the law says that the man has to maintain you even after you divorce him or as a widow or as a partner, you're supposed to be a co-sharer mm -hmm. in the man's parental property to which you've contributed nothing. Mm -hmm. So if you have contributed nothing to that family kitty, mm -hmm. why should you then go claim you don't want to bring anything to that family, not even gifts mm -hmm. you don't want the parents of that groom to get nothing out of it you want to claim it all and you know these days with increasing nuclearization of the family parents can't anymore count on the son support in their old age they cannot anymore count that they will be welcome in the family in the house of their son and daughter-in-law most daughters-in-law treat in-laws as a liability. They want to get out of it as soon as possible. But they want the right to property. Mm -hmm. Now, these parents are going to be left high and dry. Yeah. So why should the girl's family not compensate for sending, in a way, a predatory force into their family who will claim all the rights mm -hmm. but wants to give them nothing? Yeah. So I really think that it's only fair that parents demand some kind of compensation knowing full well that from now on their rights are going to be really uh, circumscribed heavily. Only a few lucky ones can count on their son's support. And the fact that dowry has nothing, modern day dowry has nothing really to do with the daughter's, uh, daughter's share of the property as it used to be in the case of Sridhan mm -hmm. is evident from the fact that the amount that is given in dowry depends very clearly on the status mm -hmm. of the group, the job status of the group. Mm -hmm. For example, if it's an IS officer, if a family has three sons, one is an IS officer, the other is a mere school teacher, and the third one is doing farming. The IS officer will get several crores by way of dowry mm -hmm. because his <laughs> job brings rapid upward mobility for the whole family, contracts, land grants, this, that, and the other, and endless opportunities for corruption, money-making, status, everything. So he's going to get a lot of money because even the girl's family is going to benefit from that 
connection. Mm -hmm. Whereas a school teacher will get a very modest uh, dowry. Uh, a few lakhs, maybe, certainly not anywhere near crores. And the, the third son who's doing farming might find it difficult to even get a wife because most women don't want to marry a farmer, leave alone get dowry. So in Punjab and Haryana, for example, they're actually having to import wives from other states because there's such a dearth. Mm -hmm. And Punjab girls don't want to marry farmers. I mean, you know, honestly. So it clearly is then groom price, nothing to do with uh, daughter's share in the property. So this transformation is what we have to understand before we start, start shouting slogans. Yeah, um, I didn't have uh, such a good idea about how Islam um, might have uh, impacted the situation. And then I had some idea that British laws uh, might have impacted uh, uh, the situation, but I certainly didn't think of Islam. And it makes sense because in the South, uh, definitely it's we don't see that much of, uh, uh, you know, the Ghalis and the very culture. It's a shock sometimes. I mean, I, I live in South India. I mean, when I used to live in India, I used to live in South India. So when I went to Delhi first time, it was quite a culture shock. So, um, yeah, I can relate to uh, what you're saying. But even in the South, if you are part of the Brahminical society mm -hmm. and you've lived in amidst that community, you're not likely to find Ma Ben Kigali. Yeah. But Never. other castes that have have mm -hmm. begun to, I mean, for example, in Andhra, mm -hmm. where this presence was very heavy mm -hmm. and certain castes and communities that have lived in close proximity, mm -hmm. their language and their tongue has been definitely Islamized. Yeah, yeah. And my and are very common. Uh, yes. I've heard them. Gee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, it it's a sort of starts there and then becomes you know somewhere in the psyche uh, it's it's there that you can uh, you know um, exploit women and it's okay to do that. It starts with the little things with the language and so on and um, goes on to become um, more serious things, I suppose. Um, in the Dharma Shastras that I have read, uh, the only mention I find is. Um, you know that uh, that fathers must adore um, um, their uh, daughters in jewels, and that's the most respectable kind of marriage um, uh, to perform the Brahma Vivaha. Yeah. And uh, and that that we see uh, we see that uh, in the south too, and usually it's the Mangal Sutra, which is the you know the gold chain, um, and uh, that that's that's pretty you much. Know, the diamond jewelry also that's. Uh inevitably part of it, not just Mangal Sutra. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would be the most basic uh, way of doing it, yes. Um, so, um, so no, I have... you know, in, in your list of questions, mm -hmm. you had put this, what if the daughter is earning? What if she's in, you know, an earner? Why should her parents then be paying down? Okay. The answer to that is, Again, linked to some of the early things I said. Let's say a man and a woman marry. He's earning 50000 and she's also earning 50000 a month. But he's going to inherit his parental property, mm -hmm. assets that will keep enhancing in value with time. If you own a house, a piece of land, a factory, whatever, these are income generating forms of property mm -hmm. whose value keeps enhancing. So he is going to get that, a share in that, which provides the mainstay of his existence. Mm -hmm. As far as the daughter is concerned, okay, she's uh, earning 50,000 and she may be contributing in part like the man to the kitty, but she's not going to, if she's not going to inherit but she's still going to claim from his property, his parental property, his grandfather's property, his ancestral property, his father's self-acquired property, and the man's self-acquired property also. But now, women, um, sorry, Mataji, one second. Can women claim like that uh, in case a divorce happens? Wrong. Oh, um, yes. Not only do they claim, mm -hmm. but they can get the man bankrupted, not just in, I mean, in America, you know, 
uh, how deadly these uh, divorce payments can be, even if the woman has brought nothing. But even in India, uh, you can claim and you can claim a division of even the house that belongs to his parents. And so many times, in-laws have been thrown out of their own homes. I know cases where they've had to be thrown out of their own house because if they don't give her the share, then she files a fake domestic violence case. Yeah. And there, in fake domestic violence cases, then it's uh, jail before trial even begins. You're arrested, you're locked up, then you have to organize for bail. So that becomes a blackmail point. And she can name, the laws have been made so so vicious and so draconian and so one-sided that she can name 10 members of that family, including a 75-year-old, 85-year-old mother-in-law or grandmother or a 16-year-old sister-in-law and have them all uh, booked and sent to jail. Now, with that weapon for blackmail available to women today, they are doing it on a large scale, which is why even the Supreme Court mm -hmm. has all 498A and all these laws, legal terrorism. Yeah. They pleaded with the government to fix things, but the government hasn't done it. But several Supreme Court judgments have tried to bring in correctives to it. But um, if you have other questions, uh, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I would like to tell you how absurd the anti-dowry law is. Yeah. Um, yeah, that tell us that. And then also tell us about, uh, I read in another essay, the, the idea of Putra Samarpan. Um, that was that was very interesting. So those two things, Malachi. Putra Danam. Uh, yeah. Putra, uh, you read it in one of my essays, right? Yes. Or, yes. or some, Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you formulate a a, a bunch of uh, rules, uh, kind of guidelines for uh, those who are getting married. So you, so it's pretty balanced there. Yes. That, no, that, that was long ago. If you mean norms for egalitarian marriage, no, no. It's all oh. gone out of the window. Okay. Given these laws, I disown that yeah. article. Mm -hmm. Yeah, given but, these, yes, I understand. But I, I still found that very interesting because uh, that kind of uh, spells equality out so clearly and beautifully. So It's nonsensical now because... Uh, <laughs> Because no, of the idea. Really have gone haywire. Yeah. And you know, lakhs of young men have committed suicide because of false cases. And because false cases can also get their own parents and their sisters and their you know other relatives mm -hmm. in jail. Uh, in order to save them, so many young people men have committed suicides. If you read their letters written at death's door, you will realize how things have changed so dramatically. Now I find many more terrified husbands mm -hmm. than abused wives. Honestly, it all changed so rapidly because you made such bad laws. And at some point, we should also discuss mm -hmm. the idiocies <coughs> and the draconian nature of laws enacted ostensibly for strengthening women's rights. Now, today, I, let me just tell you how absurd the anti-dowry law is. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure you will agree that if you want to ban anything, if you want to ban dowry or you want to outlaw any activity, the least you do is to define the crime accurately, right? Uh, for example, if you have a law that does not distinguish between murder, suicide, and death by accident, will that law work? Will you call it a sensible law? No. A murder is a murder, and you must be able to define when a death becomes a murder and when it is better to call it suicide or accident. Now, look at this definition of dowry. I'm going to read it out to you and tell me if it makes sense to you. I'll read it out very slowly. Dowry is defined in the 
amended law. There was a 1964 Anti-Dowry Act, which was really a toothless tiger. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one has not only teeth, but it has poisonous claws as well. It defines dowry as follows. Any property or valuable security given or agreed to be given either directly or indirectly by one party to a marriage to the other party to the marriage or by the parents of either party to a marriage or by any other person to either party to the marriage before or any other time after the marriage in connection with the marriage of the said parties. Does it make sense to you or did your head go for a spin? Yeah, yeah. That, that way it uh, takes away uh, the notion of a noble wedding, a Brahma Vivaha, where, you know, parents, um, especially the father, uh, adorns the uh, <laughs> daughter with some jewels. So it, it but kind of... Brahma Viva, even in America, you know, any marriage in America or England or Germany where parents don't give plentiful gifts to the daughter. I don't know anywhere in the world yeah. where nothing is given here. Anything given by any party to the marriage uh, to the other party, which is to say the groom's party, mm -hmm. in connection with the marriage of the said parties. Now, by this definition, by this definition, even the gifts that are given by the in-laws family to a new bride are outlawed, right? Mm -hmm. So a mother-in-law or a father-in-law who gift 20 tolas of gold to their daughter-in-law or buy her 21 new saris and all other kinds of luxuries, then should be in jail, right? Yeah. Now, by this logic, the girls, not just uh, the giving family, I'm uh, sorry, not just the receiving family, which is the groom's family. By this logic, even the girl's family, which is giving, is guilty party. Yeah. They should also be arrested. They should also be locked up behind bars. Do you know of one single case in all of our modern history where the girl's family has been sent to jail for giving dowry? No, it's only the receiving family that um, gets punished. Yeah. Now, what kind of nonsense is this? Like if you, if it is a crime, like giving or taking a bribe is a crime, right? So the bribe giver and the bribe taker are both punished. But in this case, the person who's giving is not punished. It's like the bribe giver is rewarded, mm -hmm. treated with a lot of sympathy. But the person who gets the bribe is the one who's locked up. Now, a person found guilty of taking or abetting the giving or taking of dowry, giving or taking of dowry, huh? mm -hmm. both, invites imprisonment for a term not less than five years plus a fine. Five years jail for giving or taking dowry. Tell me one case where giving has <laughs> been punished. Now, next is, it's a cognizable offense. So two amendments enacted in 1984 and 1986 made dowry giving and receiving a cognizable offense, which means the police are duty bound to register such a case and start investigation even without the permission of the court. And police can arrest even without a warrant. That's fairly draconian. What is worse, the burden of the proof is on the accused, which is not the case even with murder accused. So if I'm accused of murdering someone, the person who accuses me has to prove. Yeah. But in the case of dowry giving, they just allege and then I'm declared guilty. If I have not taken any dowry at all, you know what it takes to prove it? Mm -hmm. What it takes to prove that there was no dowry because false claims are made uh, plentifully. Mm -hmm. And it's also a fact that a dowryless wedding is a rarity. In fact, the highest dowry givers and takers are who? Mm -hmm. The highest dowry receivers are IS officers, IPS officers, mm -hmm. people in government jobs because they're seen as secure jobs with plenty of opportunities for making the extra buck also apart from 
secure lifetime guarantee income interestingly dowry is forbidden but gifts are allowed in the same law they say that presence at the time of marriage to the bride without any demand having been made are okay provided that such presents are entered in a list under the uh, maintained in accordance with the rules as defined under the anti dowry act first you say something is illegal then you say but gifts are allowed but then gifts you must make a list of and then uh, have have it recorded you know have signatures of the receiving and the giving party the tell me if dowry is disallowed <laughs> how can anybody tell the difference between what's a voluntary gift and what was dowry yeah. have you ever seen a wedding in which when the things come from the girl's side to the groom's family the mm -hmm. refrigerator will carry this is dowry item uh, a sofa set this is gift um or um, a microwave oven this is dowry item but this carpet is a gift it doesn't work like that right yeah. so what is all peddled as voluntary giving mm -hmm. voluntary gifts by the bride's family mm -hmm. then the moment there is conflict they say ah dowry demand we spent so much and once they start calculating they will even calculate the money they spent on flower decoration the money they spent on the wedding feast even that gets counted as dowry it doesn't make sense does it so uh, all this comes in only when a marriage is facing crisis and the two are on the verge of divorce mm -hmm. now so firstly gifts are allowed but how do you know what's a gift what's is a dowry then presents to the groom are also allowed provided no demand has been made Mm -hmm. provided that such presents are of a customary nature and the value is not ex excessive in comparison to the income of that bride's family mm -hmm. now customary in nature how do you decide what is customary what is not in my grandmother's time giving cows giving uh, farm animals was customary by the time my mother got married that was out also because now you can't even keep farm animals i can't keep a cow even if i want to the municipality will take it away so by the time my mother got married motorcycles had become more customary and within no time cars maruti 800 to now the fanciest uh, cars going that's become customary right so custom is forever changing it doesn't make sense at all to first allow something and then also ban it at the same time in the same law now the other stupid thing is i mean there's lot more to this anti dowry act that i can uh, critique uh, clause by clause but most importantly the diagnosis of the disease itself is wrong mm -hmm. it's always explained as the growing greed mm -hmm. which is leading to dowry demands well on the surface yes it sounds reasonable because the groom's family want to be compensated so jo bhi aa sakta hai mufat mein aa jaye but greed theory would make sense only if there were two different distinct kinds of families in the world the daughter uh, producing families and the son producing families so the daughter producing families would be forever giving and the sun producing families would be forever giving but in real life mm -hmm. you are giving to one and you're receiving at the marriage of the other right so if it was just greed people would say let's neither give nor take tanta mm kadam -hmm. and let's uh, keep it clean right it just work like that and then the anti dowry law the kind of cloud and draconian powers it gives to the woman to file cases alleging maltreatment on account of dowry so the domestic violence act yeah. uh, the especially the provision 498a added to the indian penal code makes dowry demands hello madhuji 
Madhuji. A very large part of it is mm -hmm. uh, addressed to dowry demands. Mm -hmm. So making dowry demands is also counted as, even if it's verbal, there's no beating, there's no, but making dowry demands is supposed to be also covered under 498A, which leads to immediate arrest. It's a non-bailable uh, offense uh, uh, under 498A. But the thing is, since even verbal demands mm -hmm. or uh, can be uh, alleged to have been made without any other proof mm -hmm. that somebody maltreated the woman, mm -hmm. how does a family prove that we never demanded anything? Right. See, this torture, if you have to go through some medical exam to prove that you were beaten, there has to be some record some circumstantial evidence that supports abuse yeah. but the domestic violence law says the woman says dowry was demanded enough woman says she's being abused enough you go to jail first then you prove your innocence this is how badly crafted and drafted this law is there's not more to its stupidities but this should give you an idea of the absurdity of the law it's poorly crafted yeah. And very badly, uh, and, and therefore it lends itself to easy abuse and misuse for extortion. True. Um, so, but uh, my question still remains, uh, Madhuji, what does an equal marriage uh, look like today then uh, in 2023 if we say that both of, both of them are working? And um, would you still think of the property that the um, husband would bring from his side um, uh, be because that matters um, that that matters only if the uh, wife is not receiving any property but today uh, many parents do give girls property as well and girls tend to take care of uh, their elderly parents as well but what should equality look like I mean an equal marriage let's say so let's confine ourselves to a woman who's mm -hmm. economically independent, well-educated, able to take care of herself, mm -hmm. and even family, right? That's one scenario. The other scenario is where the woman is not working. But we will first deal with the scenario where the woman is earning and she has a decent enough salary. So she's not really uh, a burden on, uh, not an economic burden on mm -hmm. her husband or her in-laws. In such a situation, an equal marriage would look like follows. One, the wife then doesn't claim lifetime maintenance. She should not have the right to alimony. Why? If you're divorcing and you're equal, well, quit the marriage gracefully. Why then do you drag him to court and claim his property? Claim that he must maintain you lifelong or give you a share of his property. That's not equality. It's only when women insist they're equal, but behave like hapless dependents who have to be maintained even after divorce, that the whole thing becomes farcical. The claim to equality becomes farcical. You're right. A lot of women are also taking care of their own parents as well. And many such women, not many, but a good number are also getting right in parental property largely also because you know two child family one daughter one son son is anyway gone far away parents are not going to live with him he's not really got the time and you are less sure of the daughter-in-law taking care of you so you uh, invest more heavily in in the daughter and daughters are also rewarding their parents for that now it, it should be certainly uh, allowed that see there are two scenarios in this one is that both take care of each other's families jointly so if you have four parents instead of two parents um, and the daughter-in-law expected to take care of her husband's parents only the vice versa is also true and I know many men who are doing that and very competently without so it should be then both our responsibility 
Mm-hmm. Both parents are resp- joint responsibility of the couple. That that then makes it equal. But you cannot say you get rid of your parents and move in close to my parental house. In India, one of the biggest reasons for marital conflict, false cases against husbands is when the wife wants to get rid of her in-laws. She insists that he move out. And move out invariably, many, many women prefer that he move close to her parental home. Mm-hmm. So you buy a house, you rent a house uh, next to my parents' house so I can take care of them. So that I can also leave my children with them or whatever. Or emotionally, I'm closer to them. And the relationship with the boys, the groom's family are severed in a rather unpleasant way. Mm-hmm. They're not even welcome as weekend visitors. Uh, I know, for example, friends of mine, mm-hmm. ultra feminists, huh? who have Nana Nani Ka Kamra in their big palatial house. But I have seen the mother-in-law being confined to a servant mm-hmm. ward. I've seen it with my own eyes. These ultra feminists doing it. Never the mother-in-law would be asked to come sit on the table with the rest of the family, especially if the guests were around. But even otherwise, she would just be sent food uh, through a servant. And okay, the servant quarter is not very uh, uh, very poor. It's not like uh, an outhouse, a dog house. Even if it's a decent one room, that was originally meant for the servant, but you decided to put your uh, mother-in-law there. It's no status to give to the groom's mother, right? I but have one other question, Mataji. Happening. Um, what if, um, like many women are doing today, what if women question the whole idea of going to the husband's house in the first place? Um, and, um, you know, therefore say that we either rent or, you know, generally have a separate house because that's what I'm hearing a lot and um, I'm not sure what it is doing to the Indian family and to the elderly in the household Um, but yeah your thoughts on it if women say that we don't want either parents in in my thought on this is a family which doesn't have place for old parents is no family it's the beginning of the end of the family Family survives only when every member, not just parents, you know, our traditional family would also take care of a widowed sister, a bua, a grandmother, not just mother. It's only when you're willing to take responsibility for all that a family stays as a family. The moment it's me, my, me and my kids, then and uh, accompanying it is this Western notion that after 18, it's my life, me and my life. My parents have no rights over it. Now, for example, all these young women enamored with the feminist rhetoric of my body, my right. How dare my parents tell me at what age I can have sex, when I can go out, what I can do with my body, you know. But then when they end up brutalized or raped then who do they go to same parents who do they go to next the police the judges are the police the judges preferable guardians I mean, the police and the judges also then do ask them why were you indulging in high-risk behavior why were you getting drunk in parties with unknown people in all these farmhouse parties rape parties Uh, getting drunk, being on drugs and with unknown people you don't really have intimacy or accountability with. Um, Why were you doing that? Your claims to uh, victimhood are weakened considerably when you do that. So if it is my body, my right, then it better be your responsibility. Then you don't rush to the police, handle it yourself. Or are you saying the police is more responsible for your body safety than your parents and the parents ought not to teach you safe behavior, more dignified behavior? Uh, 
So this business of me, mine means your parents, your children will do the same for you. Mm -hmm. And a society in which parents are sent to old age homes or left to fend for themselves in their most vulnerable years is the sickliest society. And in the West, that's why the family system actually has collapsed. Um, if you don't have intergenerational living, mm -hmm. then kids also grow up to be very self-centered. They don't know how to deal with elders. They don't know how to take care. You know, just seva kehte. Mm -hmm. I also, because we lived in a nuclear family since my dada dadi died very early. My father was in a transferable job. But, you know, I see the difference between me, who never grew up with a nana nani, yes, but there we went for holidays. But when you have... Uh, grandparents, grand aunts, then you learn a bit of a seva, which is very essential, mm -hmm. taking care, nurturing others, like nurturing children doesn't come easily if you've not seen that happen in your family, you know, if you haven't grown up in a family where mother, aunts, uncles, grandmothers nurture a child, you really then pick all your wisdom from the Google or from childcare books, which is not the same thing as intergenerational wisdom coming uh, about mothering, safe practices. And uh, family doesn't stay then. Uh, it starts falling apart because once your children are 18, they're gone. Uh, they owe you nothing, you owe them nothing. Uh, what's left of the family? So independence of this kind comes at a very heavy price, number one. Secondly, see, upon, leaving aside those few families where, let's say, the in-laws are abusive. Mm -hmm. In that case, yes, moving out is a necessity. Has to be done if they're really abusive. One should not suffer abuse. But if it's only temperamental clash or lifestyle clash, very often I hear young women saying, I can't stand my mother-in-law. She sits with, his legs up, with her legs up on the sofa. I mean, you know, these kind of little things. Or um, she eats with her hand. She can't even uh, use a uh, fork and knife. It's so embarrassing to have her on the slurping on the table. Now, these are small lifestyle uh, clashes. If you can't put up with this, think of all that you have to put up in your working environment. When you go to work under bosses who demand unconditional obedience and you have to uh, adjust yourself to the demands of your job the culture that your work environment demands of you you do that very easily huh you follow the dress code that your boss demands or your establishment demands but if your mother-in-law says please why don't you wear a sari today you know it's a diwali uh, why jeans you think it's an imposition so and vice versa, I would say that uh, the elders also have to understand that the young people, the young couple have to have privacy, have to have a life of their own, have to have a certain amount of freedom when they're not constantly living under permission Raj. That give and take used to happen mm -hmm. because people saw it uh, through the intergenerational living, which was the norm. Today, it's not a norm. So we don't even know how to do it. I, I'm sure I wouldn't know how to do it because I haven't experienced it in a day-to-day -day fashion. But those who have, I look at those families, I truly envy them. Because children are far more emotionally versatile. Mm -hmm. When on the same day, they are dealing with, let's say, a 70-year-old uh, grandmother, a bua who is uh, maybe 42 years old, a chacha who's only 35 years old, cousins who are their age and some are older, you know, so many different age groups you're dealing with at the same time. You learn to negotiate with them. You speak in different tones to each one of them. But children that grow with tight nuclear families where even neighbors don't come and go, 
don't know how to deal with even their parents' friends. I've seen in England or America when I go, the kids are very clumsy and rough. If I'm their mother's friend, what, I mean, uh, what business of theirs? Why should they even bother to say anything more than a hello and just breeze past me? But our kids will entertain you, will take care of you, will, you know, be part of hospitality um, in India's extended families because they grow up seeing that happen. So it makes people more emotionally versatile and uh, also more balanced, more secure, yes. more secure, certainly. You know, if you can count on the love and nurturing of, let's say, four grandparents, half a dozen uncles, half a dozen aunts, numerous cousins, second cousins, third cousins, cousin uncles, the kind of emotional nurturing that comes makes for much <laughs> sorry the kind of emotional nurturance that come from these diverse sources is so much more enriching than what a nuclear family can give you I agree with you um, thank you thank you Madhuji um, maybe we can pause uh, the dowry uh, discussion for today and uh, we have planned many more uh, sessions with you um, and uh, take up, we'll take up more issues uh, each time to discuss. Uh, this was very enlightening, uh, the way you've taken us through uh, seamlessly from uh, Islamic colonization to British colonization to modern times. It's, it's an amazing story you have. Um, thank you so much for being with us uh, today. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. We have had a long <laughs> chat and I spoke and spoke and spoke. I hope uh, <laughs> our viewers will not find it tiresome and <laughs> forward to many more conversations. Many more. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.